Good afternoon and welcome to all our attendees. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Please note that the session will begin shortly. Please use this last few minutes to grab a cup of coffee, get comfortable and be prepared for today's session. Good afternoon and welcome to everybody. My name is Yasser Ismail and I'm from our Learning and Development Solutions Department here at LabourNet. We'd just like to let you know that even though the country is under lockdown, we have not shut down. Today I'm joined by our experts in industrial relations and I'll be handing over to our MC Barry Gordon Davis, who is our litigation manager. He will then introduce his panel to you and introduce today's topic. Barry, I'd like to hand over to you now. Thank you, Yasser. And as they say in radio, our producer and our man behind the desk making everything today possible. Uh, I'd like to welcome all our viewers from around the country. Uh, today we'll be addressing the amended again TERS directive and uh, the practical application thereof. Now, in these sessions, it's very, very difficult to address everybody's questions uh, directly and live. Um, so what we will do if we have got some time at the end of the session, we will address uh, one or two of them. Now, in order to post a question through this platform, you'll see that everybody that's a viewer has a control panel in front of them and there is a question and answers tab that you can click on. Now, when you click on that tab, you can then pose a question to the panel and what we will then be doing is publishing those questions. And now there might be a lot of repeats of questions. In fact, in one of the last webinars, we had over 174 questions, so it becomes very, very difficult for us to, to sift through them. So have a look through the questions. If you see something that's very similar to what you have already uh, uh, thought of or wanted to ask, just like somebody's questions. And what happens is we will then, at the end of the session, again, if we have time, go and answer the most liked question that was put to the panel. So uh, without further ado, assisting me today, I have a panel of experts uh, joining me. And I want to first of all introduce Sean Snayman, who is a, a partner at LabourNet and a practicing attorney at Snayman uh, Attorneys and a part-time Labour Court judge. Now tell me, Sean, and to the nearest decade, how long do you think it's going to take for the CCMA and the Labour Court to get through the backlog of disputes in Section 73A uh, matters? Well, before this even started, the backlog is years. So this is probably just going to make it a lot worse. Um, the CCMA is pretty OK when it comes to handling backlogs. They, they, the administration process is pretty up to scratch. But the Labour Courts and the Labour Appeal Court are vastly under-resourced. Um, you now, even a case which is ready now, you're getting a date for in middle 2021. And that's before this even hit. Sure. And uh, joining us from Johannesburg is Lauren Mostat, who is the IR Executive at LabourNet. Uh, tell me, Lauren, what is the one thing that you regret not taking into this lockdown that's been extended? You <laughs> want me to answer that <laughs> on national <laughs> webinar? Um, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> more alcohol is an acceptable answer. Okay, then I will answer more champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and also from Johannesburg is Javi Erasmus. Uh, he is LabourNet's payroll solutions executive. And um, yeah, tell me as well, Javi, what, what, what do you regret not taking into this lockdown? Thank you, Barry. Um, yo, if I have to, and we actually spoke about it this morning, and I think it's because I dreamt about it, but I don't know if it would, would have been still be able to consume it, but I would have taken some Kentucky with me. 
and frozen it and defrozen it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and um, last but not least, joining us from uh, Johann well, joining us from Johannesburg, but actually locked down in Cape Town, is Sarah Urdendal. Um, and she's an IR manager at uh, LabourNet. Um, Uh, we seem to not be hearing uh, Sarah at this point in time. So once she gets on, I'll introduce you to Hello? her again. Oh, Hi. there's Sarah. Sarah. So, I don't know if you heard anything. Sorry, with you yeah. know, tech, technology nowadays and these new forms of webinars, I was just busy introducing you. What do you miss the most or what should you have taken into this lockdown? So what I was actually saying is I would have brought my own internet from Johannesburg because the Cape Town mountain keeps stopping my internet from working. So it's actually <laughs> Murphy's law that as I was trying to say that, my internet disconnected. <laughs> okay, and moving on to today's topic. Now, you know, other than the, the words that are on everybody's lips, specifically being Corona and COVID-19, I think that probably the most commonly used words of late is turds. Now, otherwise known as the temporary employer or employee relief scheme. Now, specifically relating to COVID-19, we all have seen and understand why the scheme has been put in place and it's there to provide a relief to employers and employees alike, um, all affected by the specific pandemic that's hit in the world. Now, I think that with a lot of false information that's out in the media, fake news and general noise about um, the, the, the COVID tours relief scheme, I feel that very little information is known about the genuine purpose and application of the scheme. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in running through the actual directive itself, Sean, could you give us a summary of the working and actual intended purpose of the scheme in terms of uh, the directive uh, that, that has been released and amended? All right. Um, as a point of departure, one has to bear in mind what is the source or the origin of the directive. So from there it then flows how that works and how it then interacts with existing national legislation. The point of departure then has to be the Disaster Management Act or DMA. The DMA gives the Minister of uh, Government of Government and traditional affairs, the power under section 27 subsection 1 to declare uh, a event, a national disaster, either provincially or nationally, and that has now been done. Then pursuant to such declarations, regulations can be published in order for the national government to regulate or, and manage the disaster. But however, it's critical that the DMA itself in Section 2 says that the Act does not apply where and in instances of existing national legislation being able to cater for the scenario. So one must bear that in mind. What we have in this case is in essence unemployment benefits, which is payable to employees. Now, normally unemployment benefits would then be regulated by the UIF Act. And the UIF Act then provides in Section 12 of the Act a number of scenarios where contributors, contributors being the employees contributing to the fund either themselves and of course a contribution by the employer, would be entitled to benefits. And there's only two instances provided for in the UIF Act and that's where a person is actually unemployed or where in section 12, one capital B, there's been reduced working hours and then you can claim for reduced pay for reduced working hours. All the other kinds of benefits is not important here. What the UIF Act does not provide for is the two provisions then uh, promulgated by the Minister of Labour under the directive, the TERS directive, which has been amended twice since original promulgation, uh, first and 6 and then 16 uh, April and original one was on 25 March. Now that all then being so, you must look at the preamble of the directive that starts off by saying its purpose, what is intended to be done here is to compensate employees for loss of income 
number one, and the or number two, for being forced to utilize their accrued leave under the BCA, or of course the bargaining council provisions relating to leave, in instances where a business of an employer, a business has closed, it's all in that preamble, um, resulting in them not being paid. So what we have here is we have people that are still employed, but not getting paid. That's an anomaly because normally if you're employed, you get paid. And secondly, uh, being compelled to take your leave under circumstances where there's a forced closure of the business. That's also a nominee not catered for the UIF Act. So that thing being so, the directive is aimed at those two scenarios because that would not be covered by national legislation. We then unpack the directive itself and then what it specifically says is it, it has a purpose and the purpose is in section two or clause two is a better word of the directive. And that then entitles or the, that establishes the TERS fund and it says that employees can claim benefits in terms of it. Now, there are several riders then implemented in order for you to qualify. And the first one is there has to be a complete closure of the business. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the directive, you can't interpret and apply it per section. That seems to be the common mistake these days, and it's a common phenomenon where people who read a document take individual clauses or portions of it, read just that, and then draw a conclusion. And the rules of interpretation in law says you can't interpret it that way. You have to interpret it holistically, having regard to the intention of the provision and applying what's called a common sense, business-like and practicable approach to applying it. Uh, that thing being so, and, and looking at the directive, the TERS directive holistically, the first thing in order for employees to be entitled to claim from TERS and employers to submit that claim is firstly, there has to be a closure of the business. Uh, not a reduced operation of the business, a closure of the business. Initially, it was complete and utter closure and later on it was amended to also include a part closure. But remember a business that operates and allows people to work from home and pay them less money, or a business that reduces working hours, but still operates. In other words, you're still rendering a business for which you get paid by your customers and your client is not a closed business. And if it's not a closed business, you cannot claim from terms. It's as simple as that. So either it must be totally shut down in whole or in part, and then the employees who are in the part closed section are then associated with the part closure can claim TERS, or where uh, the total business is closed, the total business can then claim TERS. So no closure, no TERS, must be a closure. Rule two, the closure must have what we call on a but for basis, the COVID pandemic as the reason for the closure. So you cannot opportunistically utilize where you've already had financial problems and you were busy on your own process and now rely on TERS to say that now I'm going to claim benefits for staff. You need to show that, but for the COVID pandemic, I would not have closed. If you show that, then you can claim TERS. If not, you can't apply TERS. All right. So, and then thirdly, of course, um, uh, there's, the, there, there's a scale of benefits that are applicable in this particular instance. And then fourthly, you uh, must comply with the procedures promulgated to make application. Now that to me, unfortunately, is a mystery. I'm sure Harvey is going to tell us something about that. But then the regulation just says where you must log it and some documents you must give, but they don't say what the application process per se entails. They don't say what the content is. They don't say what must be submitted. They don't say how it should be evaluated or determined. And all of that, unfortunately, is in the hands of the Department of Labor and can be varied by them from time to time. It's different when you vary a regulation or a directive, you must publish it and you must be clear. But the Department of Labor basically can do what they like when evaluating the process and therefore it's impossible to predict how and when and they're going to run these kind of things. Now, in the context of those four rules, then 
the latest amendment, or sorry, the second latest amendment had a clause. You all would have read clause 5.3. I'm sure there's nobody that doesn't read clause 5.3. And then the common misnomer is after reading clause 5.3, everybody says, ah, but TERS can be used as a top up. So what I can do is if my employees are partly paid or not paid in full or whatever the case may be, I can then claim on top of that their uh, TERS benefit in order to top it up. But once again, firstly, that negates reading 5.3 as a whole in the context of the whole reason for the directive and what it's intended to achieve. And then secondly, it's a misinterpretation and application of the clause itself, which makes it specifically subject to 3.6. Clause 3.6 says uh, benefits are only payable to qualifying contributors under sections 12 and 13 of the UI Act, UIF Act. So if you are not a qualifying contributor, you can't get the benefit. And then if you look at part payment, the qualifying contributor is dealt with in 12.1b. And 12.1b says that no matter what, no matter what, you can never get anything more in total, including the payments by the employer than what you would have received as a benefit if you were totally unemployed. So you can't, for example, say, I'm earning 40,000 Rand per month. My employer has a 50% reduced working hour. Therefore, I'm earning 20,000 Rand per month. So under the UI Act, I now go and I submit a claim for a benefit and I can take my benefit and I put it on top of 20. Because let's just use as a simple example, the maximum under the UI Act is 17,000 Rand. If you were totally unemployed, the maximum you can get is 17,000 Rand. So you can't take 17 and put it on top of the 20. You can never get more than what the, bottom, the minimum is in there. So basically what it boils down to is if you drop down to a salary level below what the maximum benefit is, one can utilize uh, a UIF claim under 12.1b in order to claim a benefit. But you can do that under the UI Act. That's not what's contemplated by TERS. TERS is not intended to replace the UI Act. The UI Act caters for it by way of national legislation, where reduced working hours leads to reduced salaries. And why you can't, uh, so, so in that context, you can't use TERS because firstly, the business is not closed in the case where it's still operating. And secondly, you can claim under the UI Act. But even if the business is closed, it doesn't matter, you still can claim under the UI, UI Act because it allows for part payment, part working hours. But then even then it says part working hours, not just part payment. For all of these reasons, then what you then have is you can't top it up. What one can perhaps feasibly argue is to say that where my salary is now 5,000 Rand per month, where I used to earn 20,000 Rand per month, I can claim to the maximum of my benefit, uh, which I would have only gotten if unemployed, but that's not what TERS is aimed at, that you can use the UI Act for. There's no reason why you can't. TERS is there where you pay zero. And in that context, um, out of our discussions amongst each other, and assessing what the employers do out there, the unfortunate reality has arisen where people then submit claims to TERS, where they actual fact pay their employees something and they say zero. Sure, Sean, a follow up question with that, um, and, it, and it relates specifically to, again, and I think that's where a lot of uh, misunderstanding comes, and that's specifically with regards to the understanding of the partial closure of business. And what, what genuinely gets asked, and uh, <laughs> It's, it's a common scenario that where a business might actually close its doors, but the physical doors, everybody's still working at home. However, there's certain aspects of that business, your receptionist, uh, maybe an office manager, they obviously, as a result of that, that um, physical closing, not actual closure of the business, are unable to render their services. 
And we, we're getting some reports that these guys are approaching the UIF and the UIF is saying, get your employer to apply for terms. That's, that's not correct. I'm, uh, I'm correct. No, no, look, what, what happens here is what is a part of a business is determined by the business itself. So it's a pretty dynamic concept. Um, it could be, for example, where you say there's, there, there are businesses where certain operational personnel can still continue working and, uh, and operate whilst administrative personnel can't. I have no difficulty in you saying, well, what I'm going to do is all of the administrative personnel who really can't give any contribution, who can't work, <clears throat> who can't come to the office, who can't work from home, I'm closing that part of my business and I'm not paying that staff can apply for TERS. That's why the partial portion was inserted and changed from the holistic closure which had originally existed with the first set that came out on 25 March or 26 March, depending upon what date you want to use, the date it's signed or the date it's published. So <clears throat> I've got no problem in that context, but the moment that you have people work from home, when you say, as an employer, you shall continue working. I require you to render service. And you then say, because you don't render service like you used to render service in the past, I am going to pay you less. That's not terse. You see the distinction between the two. 100%. And both of those, and, and another takeaway from what you were saying is, it, and, and leading back to my question, is, is that both of those scenarios, um, the, the UIF Act and the benefits under that UIF for reduced working hours in both those scenarios could apply, where an employer chooses not to go and pursue a TERS application. Uh, they Those employees would still be able to claim through the normal benefit. They shouldn't be pushed to, to a TERS application. Absolutely, because if you look at clause 3.1 of TERS, although it says there the employer must make application for TERS on behalf of employees, if you read the clause as a whole, you'll see there's a reason for it. And that reason is the maintaining of social dis distancing and to avoid contact between officials in the department and individuals coming off the street. So what it basically does, it's almost like a judicial or a legislative imposition of agency where the employer in effect acts in name and instead of the individual contributors in order to apply for TERS so that the objectives of social distancing and non-interaction with personnel can be met. It doesn't now all of a sudden change the beneficiaries from who they are. It doesn't mean that employees can't apply. It doesn't mean that, that only the employer can apply. It also doesn't mean that the employees can't still pursue their rights under the UI Act. It just simply facilitates application where normally employees would have to participate, but now it can be done on their behalf by an employer. So you're 100% correct there. Nothing stops employees from still applying under the UI Act. And I'm quite sure that those applications will have as part of them a declaration whether or not you have received the TERS benefit in order to avoid fraud. And that then brings us neatly back to if you apply for TERS and you say employees are paying nothing and you in fact paying them, you as an employer are committing fraud. Now, um, one of the biggest headaches that, that consultants have been facing and dealing with is specifically the amendments and these changes. Um, whenever advice is given to uh, clients alike, there's always this caveat that it's ha that's how it is at this point in time. That's how it is prior to amendments. Now, um, from the first directive that was issued on the 25th of March, we then subsequently had an amendment on the 6th of April. And even despite the fact that we've been having a whole bunch of webinars since then, we actually had an amendment to the directive that came through on the, the, the 16th of April. And yes. that obviously then alluded to a, a number of changes. So I want to ask Lauren, if, if you could give us a, a, a summary of the amendments that have come in, specifically relating to the ones that have been amended through the 16th of uh, April this year. Sure, thanks Barry. Um, so yes, that's been our life. Every two weeks is a new amendment. Um, I do 
want to thank the departments for re-looking really at it, making it more clearer, and just for companies and ourselves to understand it. Um, so I'm just going to do a very, very broad highlight of the amendments. I'm not really going into what does it mean. So between the three directives and the amendments, so firstly, there was a very clear amendment from the 25th of March directive to the 26th or to the 6th of April, apology, where it stated that, or just said, what is what is the what's the definition of temporary layoff, where they've included a um, reduction in work following a temporary closure, meaning from a company's perspective. Then the very the important one that came through, where it stated that a company does not need to be closed, temporary closure of business. So what the temporary layoff then meant. It means that companies that are partially or completely closed as a result of the pandemic can claim for TERS. So in the past, we had companies that said, but I'm a, um, I can't think of any example. I'm a marketing company. I've got big contracts. I'm in essential services. I'm still busy with my contracts. But then I've got clients that are not in essential services that were forced to shut down as a result of the lockdown. So half my business is operational. Half my, my staff I had to lay off as a result of the lockdown and the other half my staff are still working because they are, are bounded by the SLA with essential services companies. So I'm not allowed to apply to TERS because I'm not completely locked down or shut down, I'm still getting revenue. So that amendment made it very clear to say that completely shut down or partially shut down. Mm -hmm. That doesn't from a um, opinion of how it's read to say that partially getting paid, it's physically you're either completely shut down or partially shut, partially shut down. The second aspect to this, where the amendment was um, changed from the 25th of March to this, the latest one on the 16th of April, which stated now that payment companies can apply to TERS where they have forced the staff to go on leave. Where they have placed the staff on leave, the staff would have been laid off, they had leave entitlement left, um, either it's an entitlement to staff, it, it must be paid on termination, whereby the employer then used the basic conditions, their rights within basic conditions, and said that the employees should take the leave. Uh, Tess is now come back to say any employee that was forced to take on leave or agreed to take on leave can apply. The employer can apply to Tess. Mm. The third amendment and what Sean um, alluded to is with regards to why the Tess application so that the employer applies on behalf of the employee in view of social distancing. And this has now also changed that this is not done through a website or sorry, it's not done through an email sent manual submission. But there's now a website, um, which we've been using and quite impressed with it so far, that there's a website that employers can apply online and all the documentation is there. There's also not a signed MOU. The MOU is now accepted electronically on the website. Um, and then just the amendments with regards to bargaining council, which is also confirming if there's any amount paid by the bargaining council, the long term bargaining council, the bargaining council applied to this that the employer cannot apply, there cannot be two payments made, there can only be one payment. And this regards to um, annual leave, when it's applied, it can be settled. I think just one note, that the section within the directive, they um, refer to section 22, which refers to sick leave. I'm sure that was a typing error, it should be section 20, which refers to annual leave. Mm -hmm. And, and thank you for that, Lauren. And, uh, and now with you, yourself giving an overview of those most recent changes, we've seen how this this uh, this directive has basically evolved. It was something that was put into place at very short notice, and we've got to commend the architects of it for that. Uh, but we've obviously had to have these amendments to, to evolve with regards to the practical applications. And with you and Sean going through the directive as you have, I, I think I, what we need to really do now with our, for our viewers is really get down to the, the practical applications of what all this means in layman terms um, and really get into those, those crux questions that are being asked of us. And specifically, starting at the top. Now, a lot of stuff might be repeated, but I think we just need to emphasize a lot of the things. And, and Lauren, staying with you, specifically with regards to the who is the contributor, um, is the, you know, who is seen as a contributor to the UIF and um, who can then claim? Sure. 
So Barry, the a contributor is a employer. So by, for example, employer and employee contributes to UIF. So that 1% that the employee would contribute every month and the 1% that the employer would contribute. That would form the definition of a contributor. Also, anybody that was employed on the 27th of March 2020 and who is a contributor to UIF would fall in the definition of contributor as the director. Now, the next question I want to pose to Sean, and um, so far on our live event Q&A, it is the one that, that is most liked at this, at this point in time. So I think it's the one that everybody is wanting to know. Um, I think that you did give the answer within your, in your um, uh, initial going through of the directive, but what about employers who have paid the full salaries of their staff for the month of April? Can they now claim that money back? On what basis? They paid it themselves. Correct. No, but you, if you, you can't. If you, the terms can only be used in one of two cases. One, you don't pay employees at all. Or two, you force them to take leave and then you utilize their leave to pay them. If it doesn't fit in with those two, you can't claim terms. So effectively, if their April salaries have been paid and it's not in any other form of deferred payment of these April salaries, we can't then use the TERS scheme to then reclaim that money back. It's no. as simple as that. Must be no pay. That's the whole point. Because remember the preamble says, I encourage you to pay. Yes. Please pay. So, so if you maybe can't pay, then there's this benefit fund. So how can you argue on the one hand, I will pay, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll accept your invitation and I'll pay. And then afterwards you say, well, then give me my money back. It doesn't work. Like that. So that, that's a great segue into the, the next question then is that, and, and it's something that Lauren was alluding to in the amendments with regards to, and that's where this confusion is being created. Specifically, the MOA and the directive itself is talking about offsetting payments and so forth. So when it comes to payments that have been made to employees, what is the form of those payments that can be offset, Sean? Right. Right, so you just must make it clear. So what, 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 the, what the directive does is it asks nicely in 5.5, please basically spot us the COVID benefits. Pay it up front. Uh, the department's going to take time. Applications are processed. People need to eat now. So we ask you quite nicely, please pay the employees their COVID benefits out of your pocket. If you do it on that basis, you can claim TERS, and then when you recover the benefit, you can keep it for yourself. You set it off against that which you've paid. So if you want to pay your staff an advance on a COVID benefit, you better make sure that you convey it as such. And then when you submit your application, you would still submit it as a zero payment to staff because you're not paying them. What you're doing is you're accepting the invitation in the directive to advance the money in lieu of claiming it back, which is different to paying them their salaries. And, and I think that's where it comes down to this whole no good deed comes unpunished. And I yes. think that the, the spirit in why people are paying their, their, their employees for their April salary by that very nature is what's actually, you could call it doing them in for a, a claim against it. And I agree, that's not the spirit. Now there's something else as well that then creates a little bit of confusion with regards to an employer who pays their staff 100% of their salary that month versus a employer who pays 100% of their salary that month, but calls it forced leave. Why would forced leave be seen as something that could be offset, but not a salary that has been paid? Because the regulation says so. It wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for the regulation. The fact of the matter is, if it wasn't for what was contained in that directive that you can claim the leave payback from TERS, you wouldn't have been able to do it. It would have been no basis. You would have utilized the leave. You would have paid the staff. The staff would have gone into a negative balance on leave or the rest of it would have been unpaid. And that would have been the end of the debate. That means that that staff member going forward there, if he wants to take his annual leave in December, would do so unpaid. So basically what you're doing is you're taking an advance of that which you've already accrued for yourself. 
And now that is not a BCA contemplated scenario, neither is that a UIF contemplated scenario. And that for that reason, it's not dealt with in national legislation. And for that reason, it must be specifically provided for in the directive. And then finally following on that, that is why the directive says you can claim back the leave. So in other words, what you would do is the claim is still the employees are still unpaid. They're basically using that which they've accrued in order to get salary for them. And now what you do is when you get it back, you take it back. It goes back into your bank account and you credit them to the value of what you've gotten back for them. Because think of it this way, though. You know the benefit's not the guy's total salary. It will never be. We know that as a matter of practice. I also heard some concerns and several of these people being interviewed on news and radio by saying, oh no, people will get their salaries out of TERS. People will not get their salaries out of TERS. People will get parts of their salaries out of TERS. So that means that if you've utilized leave, 21 working days leave, and that resulted in employees being fully paid for April because you used their full 21 day leave quota, those people are going to get back 10 days or maybe 12 days. Yes. And then that is going to be attributed back to you and you're going to credit leave to that value. That's all. So, so just to just to focus again on the practical application of that uh, is where employers go and pay, pay in the form of leave. And then let's say it happens now. Fortunately, you either get your uh, benefit paid from from TERS or it happens maybe at the start of May to offset the leave that was taken in April. The, the employer as a result of that, can't go and now say, well, OK, great. Um, uh, I'm going to now take that money. I've already paid you your leave. Let's, that's all good and well. The employer would have an obligation to credit those employees that specific portion of their leave that was then obviously offset by the TERS benefit that was received. Correct. Now, um, a, a very good question as well with regards to the offsetting of things. We have a lot of employers who uh, going into the initial lockdown, we're expecting this 21 day lockdown. We all know that that was now extended. The rest of April was to, uh, was now declared lockdown period. Some businesses operational requirements going into the lockdown have now changed as a result of an extended lockdown. They may have been consulting with employees at the same time that this lockdown has occurred and people are on that hard lockdown and shutdown and they've applied for TERS benefits. Employees are now uh, either accepting voluntary retrenchment packages or they are actually physically retrenched. Now coming into May, can employers when they then receive these benefits offset the notice and the severance pay due to employees? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> the one's got nothing to do with the other. The, 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 the very fact is that TERS in itself contemplates a continued employment relationship. And you once again, you cannot utilize uh, the provisions of a of a directive intended for a certain purpose to achieve another purpose. So if you are conducting a retrenchment exercise and you have to pay severance pay, under uh, the provisions of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. There's no way that you can use TERS in order to come back, get back that. Uh, you may argue that um, under notice, you know, if, if it's still during lockdown and still during a shutdown, it's still a no work, no pay scenario because it's still impossibility of performance. Normally, if one does notice, you've got one of two choices as an employer. You can require an employer, employee to work out their notice or you can pay them in lieu of notice. But that still contemplates the very basis that that employee must be able to tender service and you must be able to accept that tender. If that still remains the situation, then the period of the notice pay would still not be payable. And then one can say if the notice falls within the period of when TERS is still applicable, um, you could still claim TERS. The guy's still working. He's supposed to be at work during notice. He's not working during notice. The reason why he's not working is because I'm closed. The reason why I'm closed is because of uh, the COVID pandemic. And therefore, uh, the closure is linked to the COVID pandemic. Uh, that's why he's not working. That's why he can't work out his notice. Uh, he's not getting paid anything. I make the application, I comply with the requirements of the directive and I get back some money that at least he can get something out of his notice. Otherwise, he's going to get nothing. And um, 
let's get into some of the practical applications from a from a applying for it point of view. And, and Sarah, I'd like you to come in here specifically with regards to the different manner. I know that there's be that when we started with the TERS application, there was this manual application, and then we let, what are the different ways in which you can actually apply for the TERS, the COVID TERS benefit? So I'm sure you all know that it's been changing a lot. So when we started, it was an email address where you would have to send through all the documentation required to the COVID, I don't know it offhand, to the email and then take it from there. At this point in time, I always say at this point in time because we don't know how things are changing, we now apply online. So you literally register online and then follow the prompts as to what they request. And I, and I, I heard Lauren obviously complimenting the online application process, um, and I know that a lot of people that uh, have been commending it, but there is one specific aspect that people have been having issues with and they get stuck at the very first step, and that is the UIF number. I can't get into this process because of the UIF number. What do you say about that? It sounds like something so simple, yet I was on the phone with clients for hours and hours trying to sort this out. So there's issues with the UIF number. You don't use the one that you've registered with SARS with. You use the UIF number you've registered with the Department of Labor. But thankfully this week, they actually updated it online to say, do you want your UIF number? So you literally just put in your PAYE number and then they give you the number. So that's been a lifesaver. Now, uh, another t aspect of the of, of the whole process as, as it's emerged, when there was this manual process only, a lot of employers went and applied manually, and now there's this online process. And there's a lot of panic out there because uh, the guys that have submitted manual submissions have not received any benefits, yet we've been hearing reports of the online one uh, employers who submitted online receiving benefits. Uh, must those that have done it manually, now go and do it again online? So again, not a clear cut answer. Those those who applied only via the email address a while back, as you say, it's they obviously upset because they haven't been paid, yet they applied first. However, we saying let's just wait for the response on that email. So if they reply, some have said, please reapply via the online system. Others have not had to reapply and been paid out. But I just want to reiterate, if you do feel it's it's been sufficient time and you're now not getting a response, you're not getting paid by the email process and you want to reapply, just make sure you've got all the paperwork so it doesn't look like you duplicating it. You actually can prove that you've already applied and haven't got a response. There's also there's also a lot of confusion out there with regards to uh, members of bargaining councils. Uh, if you're in a bargaining council, uh, is different monies, different agreements, unions involved. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is the application process for those that are members of bargaining councils? Where do their applications go? So the first step would be to actually contact the bargaining council. So to find out if the bargaining council will apply on your behalf for TERS. When I say your behalf, I mean the employer's behalf for TERS or the employer themselves. So we actually haven't received many updates. MIBCO sent out um, communication to say they're confirming that the employer must apply on the on their behalf and not the bargaining council. But otherwise, we're still waiting for feedback on that. So the first step I would just say is contact the bargaining council to find out who will apply. But again, I reiterate, please just do not duplicate. So don't have the employer apply, whereas now the bargaining council's also applied. Thanks, Sarah. And I, I would like to, there's another very fundamental practical application of TERS, and that's with regards to pay, payroll. And I want to bring Harvey in here with a, a lot of the, 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 the questions that are being asked about specifically the practical application. What's it going to look like? Um, so let's, let's cut to the chase. The first question, the TERS payment, the benefit that is re received, what are the tax implications? Is it tax free? And Harvey is on mute. OK, then I'm back. <laughs> You're going to have to Apologies. start again. I'll start again. So we first of all need to look at what is the, the, the um, options available for the payment to actually take place. 
One is either it's going to be through the bargaining council, two, it's uh, through through the UIF themselves that's actually making the payment, or the third one is where you choose that the employer needs to be paid. So if the employer needs to be paid and we need to be very specific. It's under the UIF umbrella and it's for individuals that's experiencing um, uh, financial distress at that point in time. Um, so when the money is going directly to the employee from the UIF perspective, there it's not subject to any uh, government or uh, legislative levies. The same principle will then apply when it comes to the employer distributing the uh, the, 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 the grant through to these employees. So logically, when it gets to the employer to be distributed through the payroll, not linked to any SARS code at this point in time. And um, as we've just rightfully mentioned, and everybody is, I think in two weeks time, that is also going to change. We, we some way going to have to reflect it as a payment on the IRP5 at the end of the year, but subject to levies, subject to tax. No, not at this point. Tax free, just a pass through. You're an agent of UIF just uh, facilitating the payment to the employee's bank account. Now, um, a question that's definitely going to be asked uh, and, and a practicality of the, the offsetting of payments. Now, you've just said to me that the, the TERS benefit is tax free. However, TERS by the directive is urging or, or uh, requesting that employers go and pay amounts, uh, give that money to the employees, pay them in April and then offset the amount. But now we all know that pay as you earn is one of those things we can't avoid. So we might have a scenario where employers are forcing employees to take leave, paying them that leave benefit less tax, and then we get our money back from TERS. And uh, now I know it's a complete nightmare for payroll administrators. What, what does my pay slip then look like? So <clears throat> one, one firstly is commending all the employers doing the right thing out there is uh, when the payment took place in April that it was subject to all um, legislative levies. When you then receive the payment from uh, TERS and a schedule it, because that's a, that's the most important one to actually understand what what monies have been allocated to who in your business and what is what does it actually constitute that value. First of all, when you made the payment in April, there must have been a logic that you applied to say I'm paying or I'm, uh, the, the leave that I'm paying out to the employee is based on a calculation. Um, for simple sake, I'm going to say a day was equal to a thousand rand. The pay that I, the money that I, uh, and I paid the, the employee a value of five days for that matter, which was five thousand rand. I only received two thousand rand back from this at the end of the day. That constitutes two days at the end of the day that I can credit the employee on his leave balance. What I see is then one is a, a, a recovery of the 2000 rand, but not a physical payment on the employees. It's a credit on the employees um, leave, uh, leave accrual or the, um, uh, what is the word for it, that uh, your leave provision at the end of the day and also a negative value that needs to contra that 2000 rand that you've paid the employee as a taxable value on the payslip on the previous month to give him that uh, benefit back as well. Another common question that gets asked about the application process, and perhaps you can help us with this, Harvey, is specifically the banking details. Whose yeah. banking details are used? There's been these uh, myths going around or noise that you have to create another banking account and uh, all these. Could you take us through the, the dynamics of the who it gets paid into, which bank account, which one do you declare? Okay. So as with all the, 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 the changes that came through from TERS, initially what came through is that there needs to be a separate bank account. But that was more specifically uh, focused on to the uh, bargaining councils although it was good practice to say the employer also needs to do it. But um, so at the end of the day, you don't need to create or open a separate bank account for where the money from an employer perspective, where the money is going to go to. Um, looking at the data that you submit through to TERS for your application, there's two, two clearly different records that you need to define. One is where the money needs to be paid to, then part of that is also advising what is the employer's banking details and then your data records. Data records being your employee's details. 
Now, when we look at your employer record, that's your banking details for your employer. When you look at your data records, which is your employee's details, that will be your employee's details and your employee's banking details at the end of the day. Why, even if it goes directly to the employee or goes to the employer, somewhere along the line, um, there is going to be an auditing process that takes place. It's most probably going to be by, uh, I almost want to say, let me go audit you. That is where the Department of Labor will most probably sit down and say, this is the detail that you've submitted. This is the employee's banking details that you've submitted. We paid the money to you as the employer as specified. Now I need to, need to see some type of reconciliation that shows me where the money went into your bank account and where did it go to. And that trail of the money going through to your employee needs to be able to be audited at the end of the day. Hence, it's important to when you look at the employee's detail coming through, even though you've said pay to employer, it must be your employee's details or banking details in there. I almost want to go as far as it also enables the Department of Labor or UIF to do a CSV check to say, well, this is the ID number. This is the banking details that I've got. Do they correspond before actually authorizing your payment going through to the employer at the end of the day? I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, I want to delve back in uh, with, with you, Sean, and it's us again, our second most liked uh, question that's been answered of the 74 questions we currently got. Um, and it, it goes back into the leave provision of things. And you've already answered the fact that, yes, TERS can be offset against leave. But the question and the practical application of that would I, that, that, that we would like to be answered is in our TERS application, you know, with regards to what has been paid to the employees, do you put leave in there or not? How, how do you then in your application to the, um, uh, to the, to the TERS fund declare that the amounts paid were actually leave or what do you put in there? Well, I'm, I'm not entirely familiar now with the most current format of the forms that are submitted because those change from time to time. But considering that the directive makes provision for two distinct and separate categories, uh, logic tells me that where you are claiming back leave that you paid, you will have to record that in your application um, because you've paid. There's no doubt about it. You've paid people <coughs> money. To then declare that you didn't pay them anything would be a misrepresentation. If you fill in the form truthfully and honestly as required by all good corporate citizens in this country, then you will have to record that payment was made and then you would have to record that this payment was the utilization of the employees' annual leave. And on that basis, uh, any official at the Department of Labor, if they apply the directive correctly, would understand that under those circumstances, I have to refund the benefit as well because the directive says so. And uh, my, my next question is uh, to Javi, and um, it's also basically it's a great segue because it ties into, believe it or not, the third most uh, liked question that has been of the now 75 questions that have been put in. And I, I, I think it's with much joy that we can say that our clients and employers alike have now started to receive lump sums. They, there's these payments that have now been uh, uh, received into their bank accounts. My, I know I've been getting a lot of clients phoning me with elation saying I've received this lump sum. My question to you is I've received this lump sum, but I haven't got any supporting documents, no schedule, no nothing. Now what do I do with this money? Harvey? So that is, that is uh, as you, as you like, rightfully explained then, uh, it, everybody is now glad seeing the money into their accounts. Um, but now the reallocation of that money. Best of it is uh, we're under the mandate to do that within 48 hours and it's impossible. If you if if we look at the the the, the top of if the, the 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 range of people that you're actually going to pay, it's not even there's not even methodology that you can just apply without having a schedule in front of you. Um, of uh, we've got some framework as to how TUS is actually cal calculating um, the payment per individual, I'm unable to actually get to a value where we can say this is what you can do. 
Best is we're going to have to wait for that schedule to come through from uh, from UIF that you can pin down and know who you're going to pay and what is the amount that you're going to pay because there's a lot of validations that I think is also taking place before payment is actually approved on individuals. So best is wait for the schedule to actually come through. Um, also with that is having something in writing. Um, reply or sending something through to UIF saying that I am. Thank you very much for I've received the funds to to um, to to divert the funds to my employees. Although I cannot do this without a schedule, so that you've got something on the back of this that uh, should you not be able to comply with the 48 hours, at least you can you've got something to fall back on where you've 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 attempted to do something you wanted to distribute the funds, but you cannot do it without. Uh, a proper schedule that came through that comes through. I have seen that there is employers that received um, uh, a schedule, um, but I think that's far and far between that. You've, there's a lot of people out there receiving the funds in lump sum, not knowing which which way to distribute it. We, we are now uh, reaching the hour mark, but I want to, there's, there's two questions that I want to ask, and I, I want to ask Sean again with regards to uh, specifically, and, and, and I see it's it's coming up the, 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 the light side of questions, and it's specifically the concept of top up. And to answer a question that was posed directly, um, if someone earns 5,000 Rand and the business is now closed, can you get five? Uh, sorry, can you get three thousand five hundred rand from tours and then top up a hundred a uh, thousand five hundred rand to make it five thousand rand? Can the employer top up the one thousand five hundred rand and tours would then still pay the three thousand five hundred rand? So I think that's where the confusion with the top up is coming in. Okay. Um, it may sound like semantics, but it isn't. Uh, it's all linked with the basis for payment and the intention. And one always looks at that when you interpret and apply whether or not there's been compliance with the statute. So if I pay my employees of my own accord, whatever percentage of their salary, and I then submit an application to TERS in which I indicate I paid my employees of my own accord the part of the salary, and if the directive is applied by the Department of Labor as it should be applied, your application will be rejected. So that's how I see it. That's first one. Second one is if I apply, if I pay my employees, but I indicate a zero balance in there, as I said to you, then I will get paid, but I'll get paid on the basis of committing a misrepresentation and fraud. Thirdly, where I in actual fact did not pay my staff, I submitted a proper TERS application for them in the normal course, and I got back from the Department of Labor the princely sum of 3,500 Rand for each one of my employees. And having received that, I say to myself, you know what, really, that to me is too little. I want to come to the party and help out a little, and I will give them something extra. And I'll give them each a 1500 Rand extra so that they at least get 5000 Rand. That is not paying the employee's salary. That is an ex gratia payment which I make of my own accord, and that would be in line with the plea extended to employers, not only in the TERS directive, but in a numerous amount of other uh, regulations, including the main regulations itself, that try your best and convey some love to your employees by giving them some money. And so be uh, careful how you do it. That's what I'm saying. So nothing says I will help you out by giving you something in addition to your TERS benefits. It's wrong to say get, I will pay you and then we top up your salary from the TERS benefits. You see that it might be subtle, but it's critical. On, on, on simple scrolling up of the top 10 questions that we received, I, I'm glad to say that we've answered uh, all of them. Um, 
uh, in in statements that we've been saying as well. But uh, just one thing I want to ask about is, um, and Sean, I've got two last questions for you. The last one is one that was posed to us: is how long is the TERS um, uh, uh, scheme going to be in operation? How, uh, you know, if this, the, we know that there's going to be this phased off uh, lockdown where some employers may be able to work and some employers not. How long do we foresee the scheme being run and employers being able to claim from it? That's going to be an interesting one. I'm going to have to have a look and see. <laughs> and I'm going to have to have a look and see why, uh, how, how that's going to be done. The reason for that is, of course, if you go back to the to the uh, Disaster Management Act, you'll see that, that pro the provisions and the regulations under there can only last for a period of three months. So the act itself says three months, but then it can be extended on a month to a month basis by the minister. So legally speaking, TERS can't last longer than three months after promulgation of the, the state of disaster. Uh, on each occasion, it would have to then be extended on a month to month, to month basis, but then there has to be proper cause for that. So you can't, for example, go and say, OK, now I'm going to make TERS apply for the next year because the, 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 the empowering statute being the Disaster Management Act doesn't allow for it. And you can only do what the statute empowers you to do. So, uh, so theoretically speaking, three months it's over, and this then extended on a month to month to month to month basis, provided proper cause is shown as contemplated. I think that is either 27.3 or 28 of the DMA. I'll just need to go and check again. Now, in closing, Sean, um, we know that there's a lot of employers out there that are, are, are struggling through this and they are looking for money at every corner. I just want to, in closing, just get your opinion on, um, you know, not using this fund for opportunism of, mm -hmm. of trying to make profit out of it or, or using it for what it was not intended um, and what the possible ramifications thereof would be. OK, now remember how these things are going to pan out is if you if there's if the, the idea is that you've abused it, you're going to be hauled before a judge at some point in time. Fortunately, I've done this job. I've done it for. Well, when did I start acting in the Labour Court 2013? So it's, it's, it's almost good on seven, eight years now. And the first question that I'm going to ask, if you're standing before me cap in hand and saying I did nothing wrong, is I'm going to unpack how you went about doing what you did. And off that, I'm going to extract what your intentions are, because that's what it's all about. So once again, as I always say to people, if you are really genuine, it will come out. And if you utilize that fund in any purposes in which you claim back the money and you don't pass it on to your employees, you're going to get a hiding. And if you abuse the application system to cater for a scenario which is not intended, you're also going to get a hiding. And as our president said last night, you will be faced with the full might of the law. And I think probably the philosophy, the philosophy is going to be no quarter asked nor given when it comes to these things. So my simple answer is, please don't. <laughs> thank you very much, Sean, and thank you very much to the rest of my panelists. And thank you very much as delegates and viewers. Uh, we, we wish you all the best and we are holding thumbs that uh, the lockdown is lifted uh, soon. And please all stay out there, stay safe, stay home, and uh, we wish you all the best. So I'd like to say back to Yasser, as they say, back to the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Barry. And thank you to our one of you for being here with us. Uh, it does mean the world to us. Please note that even though the country is under lockdown, we at LabourNet have not shut down. We are still available to assist you with your needs through our online platforms, whether it be our consulting products or our learning and development products. Please, please feel free to get, get in touch with us via the relative email addresses shared currently in the chat or visit our website for future. Thank you. Stay home and stay safe. Yeah.